Uh, welcome everybody. Good morning uh, to you from snowy and beautiful Toronto, Canada. That's where I'm joining from. And I also welcome everybody from everywhere, different places of, of the world joining in. So some of you, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, before we start, I would like to, uh, Kamran, I was not able to hear if you probably have told us about the two part of the session today in 90 minutes. First part is 45 minutes, where, we, where I'll be asking our uh, practitioners and panelists about our topic today. And the next half, 45 minutes, we'll have a Q&A session. Is that correct? Uh, yes, correct. Correct, please. OK, Thank perfect. You. So. Uh, so what I will do is I'm going to start with brief introduction. I'm going to introduce myself first. We'll take about one minute each uh, to introduce, and then I will request our panelists to introduce. So my name is Mehboob Kareem. Uh, I live in Canada. I've been here in Toronto for the last 30 years. I work as an asset management advisor. And I advise at Deloitte and many other, uh, you know, uh, industry. Uh, I have uh, 30 years experience in asset management and reliability projects in oil and gas, mining, transportation sectors in the US, Canada, and Australia, and of course, in Pakistan. Uh, with this, I'm going to pass on to uh, our panelist, Maha. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am Maha Ubakar. I am a proud mother of a 10 year old. I have done my MBA from IOBM back in 2007. And uh, I have 11 plus years of experience both in supply chain and finance. Uh, I've worked across different industries, which includes pharmaceutical and FMCG. Uh, I've also worked for multiple markets. Uh, Obviously, it's uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, for sure, and then Middle East and Iran as well. Uh, so, uh, over to you, uh, Mebu. Thank you. Thank you, Baha. Uh, we have uh, Asnul Haq Siddiqui. So, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I'm Asnul Haq Siddiqui. Uh, I've been uh, working in a 3 pill uh, industry for the last uh, or nearly three decades. Uh, I, I, I run my own business, I own three field companies. I also uh, uh, involved in an academia side uh, along with the uh, uh, PIFAR Training Institute. Uh, PIFAR Training Institute works under the ambit of uh, Pakistan International Freight Forwarders Association. And I'm a FIATA trainer, Federation of International Freight Forwarders Associations based in Switzerland. Uh, FIATA have a consultative status with uh, with the UN uh, regarding trade and transport uh, uh, things, uh, whatever developments happens in, uh, globally. So I've been involved in uh, academia side since 2007. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so as you know, this uh, seminar has been, webinar has been hosted by Institute of Business Management in Karachi, so obviously we have uh, our faculty member, Dr. Mahmoud Ali from the, head, uh, he's head of department of uh, institute. So go ahead, Dr. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Mahmoud. Uh, I'm managing supply chain department at uh, IOPM. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing department in, uh, in IOPM and uh, I'm very excited to be part of IOPM and, you know, we, and this is part of series uh, and excited to, to be joining this webinar. I have my PhD from uh, England. And uh, before starting my PhD, I have been, I've worked for Citigroup and Bank of America and some uh, major corporation in US. And then uh, I switched to academia and uh, I love to be in academia. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So the whole idea of the Institute at IUBM is to bring practitioners and academia together with these kind of webinars. This is where we learn. Uh, we 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 learn in 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 the institute, and then want to see what's what is going on outside in the world, and we bring that together. So we have launched a series of supply chain uh, trends, which we think will be uh, uh, happening in 2021. 
This is the first series of the five series webinar. Uh, you'll be getting information on the other topics. Uh, today's topic is uh, uh, is omni-channel, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is the big thing which is happening. And because of COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, progress has been made. The future uh, future topics which we'll be discussing will be, for example, uh, Internet of Things in supply chain, big data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and other you know, prescriptive analytics, which is uh, right now is exploding everywhere. So stay tuned for that. As you know, the rise of supply chain, um, uh, omni, omni channel supply chain is, is something which is happening in North, North America in exponential, exponential way. So this is uh, what omnichannel solution is providing is a one touch integration across all channels. So we have traditional channels, which uh, we've been using, but, but due to COVID-19 and in response to customer demand, uh, the businesses in North America and everywhere in the world is making a big strides towards offering a true omnichannel buying experience. So we are all experiencing, we cannot leave our home, especially in North America with lockdown. We cannot leave home so we can go on a website and order something and it gets delivered uh, at home. Or in future, what we, we expect that people will get used to ordering at home, but they also want to go out and pick it up. So they have to, so the businesses have to evolve and start offering different ways to have this user experience through one channel. So there is no, uh, you know, uh, uh, discrepancies among what needs to be done. So this is a big thing which will be happening and everything has been expedited. We were not expecting this to happen for another five years, but with the COVID-19, this, this has now just happened in the last five months. So things are exponentially growing and things are moving really fast. And we feel that Pakistan needs to be uh, you know, get on board with different different ways of doing business uh, in this new environment. So, what I will do is I'll get get into all the good questions and discussions we have for next uh, forty five, uh, you know, for about thirty minutes or forty minutes. So, my first question will be to uh, uh, to Mr. Rassen about uh, about in his world of logistics and freight industry. What are the current challenges uh, are you having in moving goods quickly? Because as we understand, this has to be done with very cost effectively and reliably across the borders, and it can affect the country's trade and, 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 and economy. So please go ahead, Mr. Hassan. Thank you, Mayor uh, uh, What I see uh, uh, the challenges locally uh, in this part of the world is uh, is a capacity issue number one uh, due to covid uh, the business volumes have after covid suddenly have increased and uh, carriers are having uh, capacity issues they are uh, overbooked with their current capacities and secondly uh, uh, pricing is also getting increased uh, due to uh, it's not. It's no more a traditional door-to-door uh, -to -door, uh, transportation. Port-to-port uh, uh, -port transportation is getting uh, uh, three PLs uh, or uh, uh, intermodal uh, movements. So value-added costs are also uh, increased uh, uh, in in all areas. And secondly, the, in in our part of the world, the visibility solution cost is also very high. That is why it is not very much uh, uh, used by the by the customers. You can say in this part of the world, although visibility solutions is uh, is uh, is vital for supply chain management. Secondly, uh, we have very stringent uh, uh, service solutions. Uh, flexibility is uh, not easy with, uh, even with our uh, systems and uh, the organization like uh, customs uh, flexibility is uh, uh, is not available uh, reliability is uh, partially available uh, with, uh, with the big carriers uh, or the big uh, global supply chain companies 
uh, they are offering very much reliable services, but the mid-size and the local organizations, uh, they are having difficulties in providing flexibility and reliability. So Mahal, to you is, uh, the question is, uh, how supply chain challenges in pharmaceuticals have uh, been handled? Because in North America with COVID-19, I think we already seen a lot of issues in, in supply chain, especially related to delivery of uh, vaccine. And, and so if that's happening over here, how can you give some of your uh, uh, views? How is getting uh, handled in, in, in Pakistan and your experience globally? Yeah, in terms of the challenges of delivery and all, obviously that's a challenging situation when it comes down to vaccines because not all hospitals, um, even across the globe, you know, in smaller areas, uh, rural areas, you don't have that kind of facility available. Uh, you know, uh, the requirements that Pfizer and other, you know, uh, companies had for the, their vaccines uh, for COVID-19 are, are very different from the regular vaccines that, that are there in the market. So definitely that's one. Uh, other than that, uh, pharmaceutical companies that, you know, as a consumer, we feel that, you know, it's all glory for them because, you know, they are taking the center stage and, uh, you know, obviously they are seeing growth in a lot of med medicines like, you know, uh, 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 vaccines for flu, vaccines for pneumonia, all these medicines are seeing a spike. But despite all of that, there's a lot of disruption in, when it comes to the demands because for certain, you know, diseases, people are not really going to the hospitals. So, you know, the demand is decreasing for some medicines. One is that then in terms of the raw material, there's been a lot of disruption there. Uh, as you know, you know, most of the companies are depending on the global sourcing and global network when it comes to the raw material and API, active pharmaceutical ingredients supply. Uh, so uh, that's been a biggest challenge, I, I think, besides the, these challenges of delivery, uh, the biggest challenge has been the raw material supply, especially in Pakistan and across the globe, uh, because uh, you know, predominantly it's India and China uh, that are supplying all those APIs to pharmaceuticals. And, you know, there was a temporary ban from China, from India uh, because of COVID and also because of, you know, our relationship with India. So we have to now rethink uh, uh, the whole uh, supply chain model. And we cannot just depend on globalization. We need to have an alternate regional kind of a supply chain hub. Uh, that can supply us and, you know, that's closer to home. So localization yes. is, is again back on track. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So these are the challenges and, and I'm glad that uh, now you and, and, and your industry is, is looking into this because this is going to be very important moving forward. So my next question is on academia. Uh, uh, so how Institute of Business Management, I know you have a very fast, uh, fastest, one of the faster going uh, department in supply chain and, and is getting very popular. So how are you keeping up with uh, what you're teaching in, in classes with uh, what is getting practiced? Because nobody knew that we'll be, teach, we'll be talking about COVID-19 and there are no courses on COVID-19, I'm sure. Uh, that just happened to be. So how are you, what are your challenges in coping with what actually happening with the, uh, in, the, in the world? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the challenge that uh, mainly we face in academia, especially being in Pakistan as a developing country, is that you know the access to the knowledge. Uh, we uh, the information that we get and by the and then we try to incorporate and you know IT information is already old by that time. So, uh, but I believe that in order to uh, uh, limit this gap. I believe there should be two strong strategies. One is that you offer some courses that build the foundation and that build the awareness, uh, like innovations, uh, uh, IT uh, implementations in supply chain. And on, on, the, on the other side that we need to offer uh, like webinars such as this one, and also training session to the students, because uh, that will bring the, and bring uh, industry uh, professionals just like we have over here, to get them to know what is happening in the industry. Uh, in this scenario, the, the one challenge that comes in that this COVID and the online education, uh, student 
and you need to realize that the whole paradigm of that how we used to teach has changed. Now students need to come and access, come towards information to get, gain further understanding. There was a time like the last year that we used to go to a student and we have the interaction and we, need to, we used to see them and you know we, we were able to offer them more. But now with the COVID and this online medium, uh, so students need to access and come to the information. So the main challenge is to, a uh, few challenges that I see is that the availability of information uh, and access to information and that we also need to realize that the whole paradigm is changing of the way the teaching is. And also we need to be more proactive in arranging this training and seminar and workshop like this for the students. Absolutely, and uh, this is very important and that's why we have practitioners in, in our, over here representing and thank you for them to coming and giving this time. And especially we have our uh, alumni Maha, who uh, we hope to hear from you a little later about your experience in graduating from IOBM and how you feeling right now going to industry, how you felt that how uh, uh, how this bridge, you know, uh, this gap was was filled when you took uh, uh, when you get in when you went to the industry. So we'll talk about that a little later. But I'm going to come back to Asin Saab about uh, technology in supply chains. So. As I have what happening is a lot of uh, new technologies and tools have come up in supply chain. And again, it's, everything has been expedited. We were expecting this to happen this uh, five, you know, you know, in 2025. But now today uh, we are having this because our, uh, when I go out and talk to industry in North America, to my client, and they're asking for these tools today, they don't want to wait anymore. So tell us uh, sub, how, what kind of technology uh, you've been experiencing or using right now in, in your logistic industry for supply chain? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mavishab. Um Technology, if, if, if I look at uh, the local circumstances, then uh, we, we miss a lot of things in terms of uh, technology that is available Uh, if 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 even if we 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 talk about uh, uh, tracking and tracing, yeah. uh, that is available uh, with the larger and better supply chain uh, organizations or or, or three PLs, but uh, uh, the smaller companies are not investing in the technology locally uh, because the technology cost is very high. So, for example, in Pakistan, we have like 700 uh, registered uh, freight forwarding companies in Pakistan. And out of these 700, maybe 200 or 250 companies have some, uh, say, like uh, technology in part of uh, uh, inside of uh, uh, ICT, have invested in their uh, businesses and providing some online visibility solutions. Uh, I'm not talking about how efficient these are but uh, they have put some money on it. But most of the organizations are still uh, managing on a traditional way in local market. Uh, uh, the, the freight forwarding industry in Pakistan has been, uh, I would say stagnant since uh, a couple of decades and they have not invested much in the uh, uh, technology use uh, in uh, warehousing internationally, or uh, uh, the distribution systems internationally. Uh, what we are having here in Pakistan is very much uh, uh, technology, which is already absolute. It means it's, uh, it's uh, very uh, old now and the new investments are actually not coming. Secondly, uh, by uh, technology is a bit expensive exercise. And if you don't have any legal backing that your uh, investment will be amortized in uh, uh, in the future or in your businesses people will not invest so that is uh, an area which where uh, local market actually is uh, suffering a lot and uh, the intermodal or the multimodal or the logistics matter lsps are not as such growing in the local market but it is limited with uh, only the larger organizations those have uh, financial resources with them which is hardly 10 percent of the overall market Absolutely. So that's my, because of my experience over here and consulting with uh, Deloitte and talking to a client, this is, this what 
I think there's a myth that technology is expensive because if you do really do your return on investment and proper ROI, you will see that uh, you don't need to invest a lot of uh, in infrastructure anymore because, and this is our topic in, in future uh, supply chain um, series where we'll see how technology and, and, and can be very effective and not surprisingly it doesn't, will not cost that much because now you have cloud-based system, you have other providers who will charge you as a service. So this, uh, so, so, you know, uh, there are different ways to, to address and even small companies can do that. And that's when uh, we will bring our, uh, uh, we have a, a whole college under, under information system technology uh, we'll bring our experts from there in, in the next series and they can talk about that too. So you're right, it used to be very expensive, but now there are different ways to to address that. And hopefully we'll be talking about in, in our in our series. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just wanted to add one thing. It's it's not just, just an application maybe or just a, a, a solution available on a, a, a cloud basis but also the human capital currently serving the industry. Yeah, so moving to Mahas, uh, what are your views, Maha? Because in new, this uh, omni-channel concept in supply chain, a uh, lot of businesses are uh, focusing into pay, uh, a customer-centric uh, model, where they see customer in the center and all the different you know, multi-channel evolving around customer. So they give power to customer, whether they want to shop through their iPhone, they want to go through and pick up something from the store, or they want to order and pick up. So it's a it's a kind of a, a customer centric model. So in pharmaceutical, do you see something like a patient centric uh, model where instead of you sending medicine to uh, uh, you know pharmacy or to a distribution center first, and from there it goes to pharmacy, then pharmacy goes to customer? Do you see? From pharmaceuticals going directly to patients? Yes, uh, Mehboob, definitely this is actually happening right now. Uh, we do have different channels uh, besides the brick and mortar model. Uh, pharmaceuticals have started doing direct delivery of certain you know, med medicines and Sanofi is also doing for some medicines. They are uh, delivering directly to the customer. Uh, there's a call center set up and all you have to do is like call over there, you know, uh, send your prescription and then they send it directly at your place. And uh, so, and they are using different, you know, business partners to help them, uh, you know, do this job. And not just pharmaceuticals, even the distribution companies have started doing that. Instead of sending the medicines just to the retailers and then wholesalers, they are delivering di directly to the customers, like Muller and Phipps is one example. They've done a great job in the last one year. Uh, they've set up different call centers. They've come up with, you know, mobile applications and different things uh, to, you know, uh, to have this kind of use technology in the right way and to reach the customer at the right time. And I, I think uh, uh, during COVID, this is like the key thing. Even a place like Pakistan is getting more and more familiar with technology at uh, you know all levels, whether it's personal or professional. We are all you know using technology a lot more than we used before. Everything you know we are getting it delivered at our place and getting more comfortable uh, about the concept of you know placing an order online because previously, you know, people were not really comfortable putting their credit card details or even paying the customer at the doorstep. The idea was very uncomfortable for them. Uh, so it's a mindset shift. And in terms of technology, more than the cost, I would agree it's a mindset shift. If the mindset is there to bring in technology, use the technology uh, for your benefit, then you have a lot of startup companies who are willing to, you know, uh, give you what you need at a very low cost. So things are available. I think it's more about the mindset than the cost. So, so what you're saying that if a patient, like if I want to order my Lipitor, I have to do it for my pharmacy, I have to pay them, there's a fee they charge, and I'm, sh I'm sure there are a lot of cost uh, of that med medicine actually coming to that pharmacy before it comes to me. So all that cost, I don't know what percent of that cost is in supply chain, which could be saved by, by, by pharmaceuticals and that will be passed on to, to, to customer. 
uh sometimes it is and sometimes it's not but definitely you do get certain discounts at the moment pharm pharmaceuticals and companies are doing that they are giving a certain amount of discount and passing that discount the savings basically that they're making they are passing some of it or all of it uh depending on their you know uh strategy they are doing that definitely it's a win win situation for both for customers yeah. and the company because that's very interesting. So one of the uh, omni-channel benefit with customer gets, and that's why it's uh, it's a user experience uh, in in here that I can shop. Uh, mm. Now we're talking about medicine, so I can actually look at who's offering the best price and who's offering a good discount. And so if I have it on mobiles, I'll just directly order from them, which I get yeah. the best. So that gives uh, power to to user, and that's what we are we are looking with this. Uh, disruption coming in that the old way of doing things will be will be totally different so exactly. coming, coming to you uh, dr mahmud there was one thing which uh, uh, mr asen mentioned is how how we can do capacity building because that's one of the gap uh, out there in the in the industry where definitely the capacity needs to be built before we make our workforce more productive so can you give a, uh, a light on how the IOBM is uh, addressing that? Uh, as I said uh, before, you know, I mean, uh, we can uh, do the capacity building by, you know, I mean, providing our student and what we are trying to do into gain them a diverse experience during their stay in their bachelor's supply chain or master's level supply chain program. Uh, we just we shouldn't be only restricted to you know the course books or case study inside the course book, but you know we how we can uh, in, enhance their understanding of the field, enhance the understanding of the industry, and also uh, 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 get them uh, to know what is happening across outside the country as well. Uh, good as I said before, in the uh, in case of capacity building, this is these kinds of webinars. And seminars are a good uh, good source. Uh, uh, we used to, when there, there was no COVID, and we we, have, we are having field visits as well to be a student to know understand uh, what is happening out there in the industry. Uh, guest speakers are also a good source. Uh, also, uh, what I believe is that we need to continue to revise our curriculum that we are offering and continue to see what is happening in the market and then bring out the bring in those courses and areas inside our curriculum. It could be a tedious process and it's uh, in academia, it could be very bureaucratic because you know the yeah. level of approvals that you have to get. So to bypass that, you can have the process in a place, but to bypass that, what we could have do is uh, get, get into the key, bring in case studies or bring in experts from the area uh, and and also give your faculties uh, uh, some leeway that they can uh, offer. They, they are following the course requirement, but they can incorporate the in, uh, trends that the trends that are taking place in the industry as well. Absolutely, and and to, just to add to that, uh, we do have a, a entrepreneur management excellence center, EMAC, uh, which has been functioning from day one, uh, which conduct these kind of workshops and also bring practitioners to to conduct those workshops and even our alumni so that's the other way you know iubm is building capacity in the in the industry i just want to add it because of covid 19 uh, now these workshops cannot be held face to face but now they've been uh, we are holding these uh, workshops uh, on on you know remotely and so we'll continue doing that so definitely Institute and other in Pakistani institutes are playing a major role in building the capacity. But, but as it was mentioned, much more is needed, and I think we need to build build this gap. With, with so, your permission, Mehmusab, I, I just would like to add uh, a couple of lines for what Mehmusab has just said. In our academia side, uh, what we have been teaching is a lot about the concepts and what the market trends are. If we add a little bit on the competency side as well. That will also uh, uh, add uh, value to the parchment because when they go to the market, they may have concepts, but when they are still on the system, they don't have the competencies to actually utilize the system. So the competency enhancement is also very important. Absolutely. 
Yeah, point well taken, absolutely. So as I'm just on the same question on logistic, um, I just want to address the cold supply chain challenges uh, because uh, uh, there's definitely uh, you must be having in logistics and definitely in, in pharmaceutical, which I'll have the similar question uh, for uh, for Ms. Maha later on. But let's talk about uh, core supply chain challenges. Uh, what are you facing in, in transporting uh, uh, things which has to be kept at certain temperature and how successful, successfully you have been doing that in Pakistan? Cold chain is uh, is a is is a very challenging task is uh, uh, because uh, uh, when you have to move a, a temperature sensitive commodities, uh, you have uh, options like for example a, a a truck going from Karachi to to Lahore, then means we are talking about one one uh, uh, one container uh, loaded on it, and that container is maintaining a certain temperature. Now you have to have all the commodities or, or, or the entire volume uh, filled with that have a certain temperature requirements. So that volume is not very much available with, uh, within the transport chains. So they have to sometimes move, uh, in, in fact, most of the time they have to move uh, uh, partial loads in a full uh, unit load, uh, which at the end becomes expensive. Secondly, this uh, uh, cold chain options are available within the major uh, uh, cities, but the rural areas are, are, are not connected. I mean, when we have to uh, transport uh, medicines to uh, remote areas, we either have to use like uh, smaller packages filled with maybe dry ice or maybe some other uh, 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 means to keep the temperature maintained as required. Otherwise, uh, uh, cold chain is available, very much available within the city areas, within the major uh, uh, metropolitan city areas. But the rural is, is, an, is an issue. It needs a lot uh, to be uh, uh, work on uh, at the moment. So uh, it is there, but not very, uh, say, uh, not very, at not at large scale. Absolutely, and I can see with all the power issues and, and it got to be a lot of challenges, especially in villages. I don't even know when it gets delivered, does it get used immediately or this has to be kept also in storage? So Maha, your your views on on how this has been handled and what are the challenges you're experiencing? Sure. Uh, before I, you know, uh, give my views, I just want to give this a little disclaimer that uh, the views that I'm sharing over the webinar are totally my own personal views and you know, have nothing to do with the company. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of cold chain, we do have a lot of challenges, honestly. Uh, one is of maintaining the temperature. In Pakistan, another big challenge is theft. So, you know, so whether it's cold chain or not cold chain, so that's, and cold chain is much more prone to theft because are, they are much more expensive items. Uh, so that's something which the whole industry is suffering and facing uh, for a lot many years. And there are days and years where it gets better, then, you know, then again, it goes back to the same cycle. So that's another challenge. Uh, so temperature, uh, yes, but I feel there are a lot of companies who have uh, these kind of facilities. So when you're transporting, it's fine. But when it's going to the retailer end, that's the issue. Even the distribution companies have uh, really, you know, scaled up and, uh, you know, uh, basically trying to meet the requirements of the pharmaceutical companies uh, because we don't, we have a lot of distributors, you know, at Sanofi and uh, they're all, they all have temperature controlled, you know, warehouses. And even when the medicine is going from their warehouse to the retailers, it goes in a temperature controlled vehicle, which was never the case before, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry. It's still a lot of companies don't follow that. Uh, yeah. But the facilities are pretty much there. But after it reaches the retailer and when, from the retailer to the consumer, that's the tricky area. Even in big uh, cities, you cannot be sure. So it's mm -hmm. not just the rural areas, even big cities, you know, because of the electricity issues and the cost of electricity, people do end up, you know, not uh, refrigerating at a certain level and not all the time. 
So Absolutely. that that challenge is definitely there, and the efficacy of the medicine goes away if if even for you know a few hours the medicine is not under that temperature. So that's yeah. that's yeah. That that's, is definitely. Yeah, I didn't definitely. even think about the step tissues. It didn't even come to my mind because <laughs> exactly. uh, we don't we don't experience over here. So, but that's very interesting uh, locally, uh, and I'm sure you have ways to address that. So we are just uh, ending our uh, first half of the session and. It was very productive. Thanks for your answer. Before uh, we break for uh, for namaz and you know, for five minutes, uh, Maha, you've been you are uh, you have a very unique uh, uh, bio data for us because you are an ex uh, IUBM graduate, and now, mashallah, you're very successful in your career. And I know there are a lot of uh, IUBM students uh, right now also connected. And I'm sure they would like to hear from you, uh, just your personal experience at IUBM and then in your career and oh, where sure. you are today. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank IOBM for giving this uh, giving this opportunity to me to contribute, and you know, coming back to the place that actually gave me the wings to fly. So uh, I'm really honored, and thanks a lot uh, uh, to IOBM and, uh, and the whole team. And uh, yes, I I had a great uh, time at IOBM, and honestly, you know, uh, as a student and as somebody you know who spent uh, you know. Uh, to more than 10 years in the industry. Uh, one thing I really want to say that whatever time you have at the university and even afterwards, you know, whatever you're doing, be in the present moment because what normally happens as students, we are always looking forward, oh, we really want to work and we are really, you know, we aspire to be at a certain position and we are always dreaming big, that's good continue doing that. But at the same time, what you're doing right now, you're going to miss that. So make the most of it, learn the most, you know, make most connections and, you know, enjoy your time because it's never going to come back again. So, and uh, I think IUBM is a great institute and even in the industry, you know, uh, we've made our name and uh, that that's a great thing uh, that, you know, you're graduating from a uh, institute like IOBM uh, that gives you a lot of opportunity to learn. And since you just mentioned, uh, there's a lot of focus on, uh, you know, startups and entrepreneurship and developing the skills. It's, it's amazing. Uh, back in our time, obviously, we didn't have that many tools that people have right now. You have LinkedIn to connect with people in, in the industry. So do all of that, make connections, try and learn from them, seek support. If any of you want to reach out to me, feel free to do that, you know. Uh, you know, I whatever little I can do to advise or guide or help you, uh, I would do that. And reach out to people. People are pretty welcoming. You know, we normally think that, you know, if you reach out to them, they might not respond or, but try your luck, there's no harm. If you reach out to 10 people or 20, one will definitely respond. And that one person might change your life in some way or the other. So just uh, keep your mind open, but enjoy life uh, every single moment while you're working, uh, while you're studying at every single moment, because you know, especially after COVID, you know, a lot of people have realized we cannot take things for granted and you know, we should take each day as it comes and enjoy it and make the most of it. So that's it from my side. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Very good advice. And uh, thank you for offering. So students, please uh, reach out to Maha if you, she's part of uh, our community and she's out there to help uh, each of you. If you aren't looking for any advice, any career, uh, you know, uh, discussion and, and what to do, you know, do reach out and thank you Maha, for that offer. So yeah, with this, uh, uh, we're going to end, end uh, this uh, part of our session. Let's take five minutes and we'll come back and then we will take questions. We already have collected a lot of questions from uh, different people and we will be answering that in our, in our next session. So uh, let's take a five minutes break and then we'll come back. I'll put myself uh, in mute uh, and maybe off audio and then we'll come back in five minutes. Thank you. Uh, all the panelists are requested to uh, resume. We are resuming the session uh, to come online, please. Uh, Mehboob sir, we have a couple of questions with us. Uh, 
Sure, let's uh, let's address them. I saw one message, which is uh, direct. It's a very good uh, question. Uh, I think uh, Maha is directed to you uh, from uh, Saad Ali Khan to kindly give uh, guidance to students of uh, supply chain like him, how they can make their career bright uh, in future. So, and also I think there was a similar question about your journey uh, to reach this position. Okay, sure. Uh, so I, I honestly believe there are like three things for me uh, when it comes to success or, you know, uh, uh, winning the race basically uh, it's one is the attitude that's key you know if you have the right attitude you have the right set of skills and skills is not something which you know we which you learn at the university and you know for the next 20 30 years you continue uh, keeping those only you need to continue uh, continuously build on those skills learn new skills unlearn and you know relearn something so that's something which you need to keep tap on the trends uh, on what's, uh, you know, uh, where the industry is going, what you need to do to keep upgrading yourself. Uh, so right attitude, right skills, and having the confidence in your own abilities. Because if you're not going to think that I'm capable enough to do something in life, nobody else is going to see you there. So uh, that's, these are the three key things for any area, I think, not just supply chain and uh, for your personal and professional life. Uh, you know, we need to have these things there. If that's there, then anything is possible. Uh, my journey, my journey has been interesting. Uh, I immediately started my career with GSK and uh, I, I had interned there and then there was an opportunity and I, I was lucky. So I didn't really struggle in the beginning and it was very easy to you know, start my career. Uh, that too with a good company. I started uh, in finance and uh, because I did my MBA in finance and I, back then I had no clue about supply chain. Uh, so you know, in the second year of my career, I got the opportunity to work for Iran market and uh, that too looking after supply chain and finance both of that you know I was that one single person looking after both so this this role basically uh, gave me the opportunity to learn about supply chain uh, to understand that I am more interested and more inclined towards supply chain compared to finance which I back then thought that that's the only area I want to you know work in so gradually along the way I, you know, made a conscious effort to, you know, start moving into roles uh, uh, that are supply chain related, the planning roles, demand planning, and all of that. Uh, uh, did that with uh, GSK for seven and a half years, worked for with different markets there. Uh, I took two career breaks, uh, by the way. So, you know, it's not uh, always that uh, simple. Uh, so, uh, and that too, because of personal reasons. Uh, and, uh, but then getting back was very, very difficult because, you know, once you're out of the uh, corporate uh, world, uh, nobody wants to accept you. So that was a struggle. So later, because initially I never faced that struggle of finding a job and all of that. Uh, but when I took those breaks, then I did struggle, but I was still lucky enough to land a good job and at the you know, right position in good companies. Uh, worked for Reckitt for around two and a half years. Uh, so uh, uh, Reckitt is... Uh, uh, you know, it's a very known company as well that makes debt all and in COVID times, every single person is using products made by them. Uh, after that, uh, I worked, started working for Sanofi. So I've been with Sanofi for the last two years and uh, it's been a great journey, honestly. I have no regrets or no complaints. Absolutely not. Thank you. That's, uh, that's uh, very, you know, promising for other students to look forward to what they want yeah. to do and a couple of things i know luck plays important but also hard work so i'm yeah. sure you worked hard and uh, and gone through different ups and downs so that's very important takeaway the interesting thing is that you were not you were not focusing for supply chain but you ended up there and that's a good that's a good thing about being a bba or an mba because you get exposure to so, so many other different field in the program and you don't have to be, if you're taking marketing, you don't have to be uh, in, in a marketing field eventually. You could be in some, some other field. Or if you're in supply chain, 
you may end up in asset management or or doing other things. So, so that's that's a good thing about the program. And the other thing, Maha, I think really helps you. You talked about internships. So I think it's very important that uh, we as as a student should all go through internships. Uh, it gets it's very very helpful. So those hey, are very important points. May I add something over here? Uh, just to kind of know about what you said about internship to our students that are listening. Uh, yeah, part of uh, being uh, your beside your courses when you come across your bachelor's or MBA program or the capstone, you need to take that as very seriously because that is IOBM is trying to open its window for you to look outside and make your own connection and see what is happening. And through that window or through that door, you need to make your own walkway. Uh, so if you take that capstone one and capstone two seriously, I, uh, seriously and put your best of effort into it and impress not uh, us, but also the, the uh, company that you're working with that can open a very huge road for you in road into the industry. Absolutely. Any other any question or comment? Yes, uh, we have a question here from Saad Ali Khan. Uh, I have been working in procurement for six years and I see there is a low rate of getting promotion in it. Is this true? I think it's a good question for as a sub, so would you, because you have been in the industry and actively also training people. I, uh, I would ask Saad uh, uh, a question in, in return that in six years, how many new competencies and skills you have developed? And if you haven't worked on new skills and new competencies, and you are keep doing the same similar uh, task for the last six years, uh, you are wrongly ex expecting uh, promotions. So if you have been working hard to uh, develop new competencies, new skills, uh, getting new uh, uh, no, uh, uh, courses, new uh, learnings, then you should be able to uh, get promotions. So ask yourself, have you been able to uh, develop new uh, skills in the last six years? Have you developed new uh, competencies? If you haven't, then the management will not be uh, interested to promote you. Maybe you are doing uh, some uh, task which is very repetitive and uh, sort of a crunching task. So- Absolutely, I'll echo those uh, comments because uh, I'm very close to retiring and I, and, and I want to retire very soon. I've been working for 30 plus years, but believe me, people, I still go and educate myself. I, it's absolutely, I agree with the SSR. You don't want to be left behind. Just getting a degree doesn't mean that for next next uh, part of your life, you've got, a, you've got a document and that will take you further. That's not true. There are people who are learning on daily basis and they are getting jobs with no degrees because they have skills. And I'm not saying these are uh, being a, uh, and there's nothing wrong to be a plumber or electrician, but these skills are technology skills. So if you can have something extra, if you have, if you're a supply chain, if you have a degree and there's a certification program, uh, which has been offered in blockchain, I will go ahead and take that program. I will educate myself in blockchain. I will educate myself in artificial intelligence. I will try to learn about machine learning because these are the things which are coming up. They come and, and they may not be taught in, in colleges or universities because these are very fast moving plan, uh, programs and, and these ideas are coming now. So you need to go back and educate and get those skills. So absolutely, I agree. And then if you're not promoted, there's something wrong with your management and then you should be looking for something else because these are the things which are needed. And if you have that, definitely you'll be promoted. You know, I, if I may add, uh, I, I've noticed that in Pakistan, uh, I noticed the mindset in the student that when they go out in the final years or when if they're working, they like to play very, very safe, you know? I mean, and that's what I tell my student, listen, this is your age, you know, I mean, you in 20s or mid or late 20s to experiment, you know, to find out what you like. Even in case of supply chain, there are different, different, different areas. You need to go and figure out what you like. You need to challenge yourself. You need to experiment yourself. And, you know, you need to push yourself. I'm not asking you to 
jump into obvious, uh, jump in front of a truck or something, but you know, you need to experiment to find out and do not hesitate to learn and push yourself to the limit. That's what I tell to my students. Good, uh, no, good, good advice. Yeah, any other? Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I think I should ask uh, uh, questions related to uh, SN Siddiqui Sahib. Uh, first one is how challenging is supply chain in our eco economy? Uh, the second question I've been asked by Anas Khan is, uh, Mr. SN, I've been part of customs freight forwarding and wish to leverage my career to supply chain management without prior experience into supply chain, but don't wish to start from zero. How to cope up with that? Uh, uh, so here are two questions and uh, then there is a question uh, last question I've done a course in supply chain from P5 I've learned many new things from Saris and I want to say thanks to him let's go one by one uh, let's, let's go one by one uh, there was a question on uh, blockchain uh, in the uh, blockchain in supply in supply chain so I would like to address that first before we get to those questions uh, come on so anybody who want to take sure. a blockchain, Maha, do you have any experience in blockchain uh, or within supply chain? No, honestly, uh, that's an area that I'm not an expert in. And But uh, definitely, I would like to learn more about it, like Absolutely. you mentioned. And, Absolutely. You know, anybody yeah. else? Because I can take a stab at it. Anybody else wants to give their opinion? No, please on... proceed. Please proceed, my sir. So the blockchain is, uh, so by the way, I just want to remove this uh, myth that blockchain is cryptocurrency. It came out of there, but it's not about going in crypto. crypto. So when you talk about blockchain, it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a ledger and it is, it is something which cannot be changed, whatever you do. So it's, it's very transparent and it cannot be, as you say, cannot be hacked. And the blockchain is very, very important in supply chain. And we're going to have a webinar on, on this topic in one of the series about the use of blockchain. So my, my answer to the, this question, which I happened to see um, while I was looking at the chat, uh, it's a very, very important question. And in future, blockchain is going to play a very important role in supply chain. Let me give you an example. Right now, we have to go through a bank even to open LC. And then that paperwork has to go through different, different steps. And before you start shipping your goods, you have to go through different stages. And that costs time and a lot of money. Blockchain is going to remove all that in between processes, and you will be able to deliver everything in a day. So once you open, once you decide something needs to be delivered, all the banking procedure where opening a letter of credit and getting approval, going to the bank, getting some, uh, uh, depositing your money and going through all this procedure process before you ship your goods, this all will be eliminated because blockchain will be a ledger by itself. And details will be talking and we'll bring some expert. I'm not an expert, I'm just, saying that because I've, I've seen this, I've, I've learned about it. So I just giving my opinion, but definitely blockchain is, which is coming in very fast. Uh, it will be it, in some of the companies over here and supply chain has already been implemented in North America and it will be coming to Pakistan also. So very interesting topic. Let's go back to the question uh, which was directed to uh, Mr. S and Kamran, just, can you just one question? Uh, I think you said three questions. Let's go step by step. There was one question and Mr. Essen already replied to a question okay. by typing. There is another question uh, uh, from Ali Murtaza for Ms. Maha. Don't you think that in a sector like pharmaceutical, Omini channel has a limited scope, keeping in mind the sort of dependence pharmaceutical companies have on distributors? Good question. I think that's very relevant. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you're right. Uh, to a certain extent, obviously, it's not easy that, you know, moving it to another channels. But the whole idea of Omni supply chain is uh, basically not to have uh, one specific channel, to have multiple channels that are, uh, you know, integrated and that are able to support the customer. They can either go to the shop, purchase something. If they want to return it, they can return it online. So, you know, 
it's it's basically having that integrated system uh, so we we are way behind right now obviously we are nowhere close to where we should be uh, but uh, having said that it is possible obviously it's not going to be as easy it's easier for fmcgs because they don't have regulations they don't have to get prescriptions and all of that if they are supplying to a customer uh, for pharmaceuticals this is an, another thing they have to keep the you know regulations in mind uh, when they are connecting all the supply chain uh, uh, channels so that's one thing yeah and obviously we are very much dependent on distributors compared to fmcgs yes uh, so it's it's going to take a couple of years for us to be there true but but it will be disruptive and uh, uh, we should not take uh, disruption as a negative uh, disruption is is positive thing uh, just like uh, we have uh, taxis converting into to uber or whatever they have uh, i think kareem or whatever in pakistan so disruption is coming and and it will be coming in every every field uh Kamran, is any other question which you want to, uh, do you have? Okay, he went offline. So I see one question which is, uh, talks about, please share some quick example how supply chain creates value. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Ali, can you address this uh, uh, from your perspective? Uh, well, yeah, Kamran, sure, sure. Uh, okay, yeah. go ahead. So see, the basic purpose or basic uh, reason for, for the rise of supply chain was it to that to uh, to create a value of for the product. Uh, if you go back, like let's suppose you go back to 70s and 80s, and when Walmart, you know, the biggest retailer of that time, they begin to realize that you know the buying from the buyer and putting on their shelf inside the store and selling them and making certain small profit. How about if they go back and study and realign their whole supply chain right from the start so they can keep an eye on the cost factor from the raw material, how it is manufactured, how it is moved from one point A to point B, how it comes to their store and how it is sold, keeping in view the customer's need and in, incorporate all, share all this information and save money wherever you could, enhance the product value wherever you can uh, save time in moving the product. So this is, so as the product is moving, you are creating more and more value. So if you can think of, uh, if you have, uh, might have seen the Stevenson book, they give a very good brief, simple picture of bread, that how the bread is, flour, is moving from the wheat form and how the value is being generated. So this is what supply chain does. Uh, following the Walmart organization begin to realize this is if we can if we can have an efficient supply chain that supply chain that is producing what is needed what customer wants in whatever way or form they want if we can produce it and get to the customer from point A to in the hands of customer in shortest possible time in the price that is affordable to customer that is how it creates value so this is uh, so it's just not one function in supply chain that creates value, right from managing your raw material from the where your uh, supplier buys all the way in the hands of customer. If you can, as I just repeat again, if you can minimize the time, if you uh, minimize the logistic cost, if you're, minimize, if you're producing quality product, if you're producing good design, if you're getting in the hand of customer in right time and need it, it all creates the value. It's a huge area in itself uh, nowadays, uh, uh, Walmart used to be a champion of uh, supply chain, but now Apple has taken over. So now Apple is said to have very efficient supply chain. And as you know, can see the product is designed in uh, Silicon Valley, manufactured in somewhere in China, then goes to distributor center somewhere in the middle and then spread out across the world. So this is how it creates value. Yes, and uh, absolutely I agree with that. And that's why supply chain is now also called value chain because that's a concept which is coming in. It's not really about supplies anymore. It's all about the source and at the end product what the customer gets. So the whole value chain from end to end is that what we are calling. And a good if Walmart is a good use case, then we have Starbucks as a good case. We have Costco because these are these are the people who are creating value in a sense. Okay. Uh, any other questions we want to take at this point, Kamran? 
ji uh, uh, we have uh, questions from students uh, i think let me combine this try to combine this into one question because everything is related uh, there is a question from javeri ashraf can a computer science graduate work in supply chain uh, and what are the skills or qualities that companies look for in fresh graduates and last question is from anonymous attendee supply chain itself is a dynamic field with many specializations to proceed with let's uh, answer and many practitioners one, let's take one question answer it sure. and then we go to sure, that sure, sure. we have about 10 15 minutes left i want to close See, it on so time there is one question from computer science graduate and uh, another question? what companies look for skill set uh, from fresh graduates ma maybe you can take that because you are directly hiring probably supply chain people so interestingly in supply chain because now the trend is that people are doing you know mbas and they're graduating in supply chain previously we didn't have a degree or a certification or commonly available to us uh, so mostly people from uh, you know people who were engineers or computer science students they were coming to supply chain uh, so back in reckit i had a team which was like all from gik i was the only mba there Uh, so we don't have too many mbas we have mostly people who have engineering background or computer science background coming to supply chain uh, if you you know look at people who've been in the industry for the last 10 15 years uh, so uh, i think uh, definitely a computer science uh, a student can definitely uh, join supply chain uh, may i add uh, to mahas uh, comment uh, you know when we come across a new student that's what i tell to my student that uh, supply chain is such a diverse field and we perform so many diverse activities and processes that you will just go you will find a place in supply chain that you like if you are good in numbers you can go to inventory control if you are good in planner go to planning if you are good in operations go to operations side procurement and the same goes for uh, computer graduate and this is what the seminar is about that how the whole supply chain idea is changing towards you know with information technologies so it's the future is supply chain and computers you know that's true uh, there's a lot of focus everywhere on supply chain previously it was marketing and sales uh, that were having all the attention and the focus of the company and now supply chain is taking the lead there absolutely uh there was another question i think let's take uh, uh, the last question and then we will like to close if there's any any more uh, maybe last two questions and then we are there is uh, uh, only one question left uh, this is from an anonymous attendee uh, supply chain itself is a dynamic field with many specializations to proceed with and many practitioners in the field have somehow background of engineering my question is as we are proceeding with more education of supply chain what generalized skills should we possess with to work in global market particularly skill set for uh, undergrad supply chain students okay so maybe asan saab you can answer that so they have outsourced their entire uh, production side to to say like china now what is their comp- core competency their core competency is their finance their design their technology and their marketing the rest they have outsourced so uh, uh, in supply chain you have to find out what this uh, a specific uh, organization which is the focal organization that focal company that is running that is maintaining the supply chain what is their core competency similarly if you take example of uh, uh, nike now nike is a global brand of uh, say like sports uh, shoes for example uh, manufacturing of shoes is not their core competency their brand their marketing their uh, uh, finance is their core competency so they are so much finding out the core competency and then establish the extent of supply chain where you want to manage it is actually supply chain management in which you have various areas you can have specialization in procurement you can have specialization in inventory you can have specialization in marketing and finance and another topic that we normally do not cover uh, in general is the specialized specialization on the modulation of supply chains their focal companies always need a need a, comp, uh, a consultants or experts in an organization those have to design the entire supply chain so that uh, the procurement and the production and the marketing and finance can run so making that 
supply chain model is uh, vital for uh, for the focal company. So sp specialization in any of the area uh, uh, one can we choose uh, from a uh, from a people uh, uh, people having engineering background can go into production and operations. Finance can also be part of the supply chain. So is marketing, but person who is having uh, there was an old saying, master of one and jacks of all. In 21st century, that is that is gone. The master of all and jacks of none is, is the criteria. So yeah. the one who is having expertise on all the areas, he will go into modulation of the supply chains. So it, depending on the individual's uh, attitude and his uh, uh, skills, he can choose if he wants to go into a specialized field or into a supply chain broader uh, supply chain topic. Absolutely. So those days are going away where there was a hardcore engineering and you're only supposed to do engineering. Today we have engineers who are becoming doctors. So things Absolutely. will be changing even um, 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 in future where your skill, whichever you feel is where your strength is and that will be needed. So with that, I would like to thank all our panelists uh, to giving this time to us and their valuable feedback about their experience and what's going outside. It's a very productive uh, session we had today. Uh, as I said, we will be having uh, future webinars on different topics, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll send you the uh, uh, topics and date and time and hope to see you again. So Kamran, with that, uh, I would like to hand it over to you to close this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, the audience, uh, the panelists, and uh, uh, moderator, Mr. Mehboob Karim, for joining us today. Uh, we hope uh, this learning series we started today uh, continue its journey, and we hope to contribute in learning and development for all of you, the corporate, the students, faculty. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, Amar. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Hello. 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 Hello